Welcome to the milk bar. 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 Welcome along to episode 543 of the milk bar. Jason Forrest here with you as ever. Coming up on the show, Donald Brown will be letting us know about his recent success in the world of athletics. Had a brilliant 2019 and the fact he's up for an award from a national athletics magazine. Also, we'll be talking to Nick Hewer uh, about a charity who are raising for children who need assistance. It is Street Child. Finding out about that one. We will have Louise Redknapp on the line to talk about all that goes on in the world of technophobia she does not enjoy setting up her devices she's got a way of getting around that one also we'll be hearing from the wonderful charlie dimmick and the team from the co-op and neighborhood watch as they've just announced some awards and as well as that Teresa bazaar will be joining us talking about dollar's latest album release oh multiple album release uh, with the ultimate dollar collection and a forthcoming event she has on wednesday of this week that's all on the way but first of all with the history boys at wolverhampton's grand theater is in-house production from the 7th through to the 22nd of february they have invited some fantastic cast down to be part of this ian redford is one of them he's with me now hello you got your picture and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hello, how are you? I'm good. And uh, looking forward to this one down at the ground, I take it? Oh, yeah, yeah, very much so. Yeah, it's great. I mean, it's very exciting. And it, 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 when you do a play and it's two months before, there's a kind of, uh, you know, you suddenly start getting edgy. You suddenly start thinking... I better do a bit of work on this now. Now, today has made me think I better do a bit of work on this. So I'm looking forward to it. I mean, I know the play and I know I've seen the film and I've seen, I saw the original production years ago and I, and I knew Richard Griffiths, which was lovely. So I've kind of got a sort of personal interest in education, um, as we all have, really. Uh, so yeah, I'm looking forward to it enormously. So how do you think some of what you've done before comes to this role? I mean, uh, is, there, uh, uh, is there a bit of a streak in there which is uh, going to help you to be uh, the, the, the school teacher type? Yeah, I'm pretty bossy. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I, I have, as I say, I've, I've always been interested in education and I worked, um, well, let me see, uh, I worked for a company called Out of Joint for about 20 years, on and off, mm-hmm. different things. And as part of my brief, I said I wanted to do the educational workshops. Yeah. So I went into schools a lot. So I've always been uh, interested in going into schools and talking to kids and trying to get them interested in uh, theatre and stuff like that. I also was involved at the National Theatre when they had their, um, you know, they had the kids coming in doing plays. They had they put them on. I can't remember at the top, top of the, my head what it's called at the moment, but I was an assessor, for, mm-hmm. so I went out to schools that way. So I've always had um, an interest in teaching. Yeah. So I kind of, yeah, and I've done lots of workshops and I've taken lots of workshops. So, yeah, I'm not entirely alien to the notion of trying to control a group of people. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, you used to work in television. And yeah. You've actually done some filming that goes uh, alongside this. And when there's a, a mixed-media production, it, I think that adds something as well, yes, doesn't it? Because it, does. it, 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 it brings a bit of outside reality onto the stage. Yeah. And I think it's also... I think Jack's come up with a good idea of doing a little bit of filming around this. So, it is, it, as you say, puts it does, takes it away from it being isolated and on stage and into the real world outside so yeah yeah and as far as your character goes he's got a very interesting story that's going to be told here hasn't he yeah he has he's a he's a and he's a very interesting man and he's been around school education for a long time and he's um he's he is probably you know the the, the chief protagonist in terms of the question that this play raises which is what is the point of education Mm -hmm. what is the point of teaching is teaching about getting people through exams is it about making them students into a commodity is it about um, just getting them to a certain stage then passing them on like a conveyor belt or is it about molding people's minds for the rest of their life is it about planting seeds in their head for the rest of their life i mean when when you talk about education it's not just for that period of time it's also for the rest of your life I mean Mm -hmm. we are constantly being educated and I think that Hector 
has been around for a very, very long time, and I think he understands, as any teacher who's been around for a very, very long time, that these changes that happen over the years, you know, there, some politician will come in and want this, and another politician will want that, and if they just let the teachers teach, let them get on with the job, then his story, that's, that's his, anyway, that's the political aspect of the story. Mm -hmm. But he's also, you know, he's a human being, and uh, he has... Uh, an affection for his students um, and I think you know all those students that, that come through him I'm sure they will always remember him mm -hmm. uh, because of that because he's what you know uh, he's the one of the few teachers now I don't think they can do it now I don't think they have that freedom to be able to form relationships with students and it's important mm -hmm. I mean it's and it goes beyond the norm, it goes beyond what regimen is about, it goes beyond all those things because as you say, you don't, you know, you don't remember subjects but you remember teachers and very well. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and with the, the interactions there, I mean, everybody makes some mistakes, some misjudgments in sure. their life and we get to see that on, on sure. the behalf of, of both the staff and the pupils. Yeah, yeah, that's right and I think that's what's great about Alan Bennett, he doesn't, you know, like all good playwrights and all good writers, he doesn't judge. Mm -hmm. He doesn't make judge. He doesn't say this bad, that good. You know, it's what a, a director friend of mine calls the dead hand of certainty. <laughs> Once you have the dead hand of certainty, oh, we know what this play is about. No, we're all of us capable of extraordinary gifts and we're also capable of extraordinary darkness as well, you know. And it's a question of actually managing that. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, we're talking about a group of adolescents on the edge of uh, adulthood. Yeah, you know. exploring who they are and, yeah. and who they want yeah, to be. Yeah. yeah, that's right. And why they want to be what they want to be. You know, I mean, Erwin, you know, ends up in, uh, well, <laughs> spoiler no, alert. Spoilers, yeah, okay. uh, <laughs> you know, there's, there's, uh, his story is, you know, he's linked with this, this experience as well. You know, it's... it's um, it's a really interesting subject. It's a really, really interesting subject. You know, what's the point of education? Why do we put these kids through this? And it, it, if you've got something that is unquantifiable, like how do you understand this poem? How do you understand this book? You know, I mean, Picasso bewildered me for years <laughs> until somebody said, just say what it says to you. Mm -hmm. You don't have to come up with, you know, high art things about it. You just think... This means something to me because it, it's, and I, I heard David Hockney say, no, not David Hockney, yes, David Hockney say that he was in, uh, walking through a gallery and he said, just, you say, my eye is drawn to this. You know, why is my eye drawn to that? Yeah, that's right. So it takes away that academic, you know, it's like Shakespeare. Shakespeare's supposed to be performed. It's not supposed to be discussed <laughs> with academics. Because it's what it gives you at a visceral level. You understand why Hotspur is Hotspur and Hal is Hal and why Falstaff is Falstaff and why the king is nervous in Henry IV. You understand all that because you see it in front of you. Mm -hmm. you know, and everybody has a relationship between a father and a son. And if you want any understanding of a relationship between a father and son, look at Henry IV, part one. The f relationship between the king and Hal. Plays do this to you, I think. Plays yeah. do that. And they don't, it's not that they, it's, it's because they don't touch the, the sort of logical side of it. It's this other side, this bit of you that, well, we comprehend stuff, mm -hmm. but we don't understand stuff. We understand stuff in a different way. We comprehend stuff through, you know, what does this mean? What's the theme in this? What does that mean? But we understand stuff by what's before us, I think. And, with, and that's something else. And with Alan Bennett's work, I mean, you, you've done, done much of it before? or No, I've not done an Alan Bennett play at all. I've read him, of course, and I've watched his plays on mm -hmm. television, and, and uh, I've read some of his plays, but I've also, you know, I, wrote, I read his diaries. I find him fascinating. Mm -hmm. I think he's an extraordinary human being because he doesn't, as I said before, he doesn't judge. He makes it um, available but he questions it, in, in, but it's in a, he questions it not in an academic way, but in a human way. Mm -hmm. And it's the humanity of it that is extraordinary, you know. And of all those, that four that were in Beyond the Fringe, I think he's the most interesting. And also, oddly enough, the most political, mm -hmm. I think. And, and particularly as he's got older, he's become more and more political, which is great.
Well, we're looking forward to your performance in uh, Wolverhampton's you. Grand Theatre's own in-house production. It is a History Boys from the 7th through to the 22nd of February. 01902 429212 is the box office number. Grandtheatre.co.uk to get your tickets. But uh, break away, have a great time, and we look forward to seeing you in the city Thank once more you. for the play. Thank you very much. It's also very funny. OK, which is good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. In a moment of this time, we'll hear from Teresa Bazaar of Dollar. Before we do, though, let's take a flavour of some of their music. On the 29th of November, Cherry Red Records are releasing The Ultimate Dollar. Six CDs, one DVD, greatest hits two CD collection as well, a shooting style limited edition LP, and it's going to be absolutely mad. To tell us more, I'm joined now by Teresa Bazaar. Hello. Hello, how are you? I'm very well. And by the sounds of things, you're going to have some from promoting this lot in the next few weeks, aren't you? I know, you just rattled that off so well. I mean, I, I, it's a mouthful, isn't it, really? It's such a lot. <laughs> there, there is everything going on. Uh, going... You, you were obviously in uh, part of Guys and Dolls before uh, everything really went absolutely mad with Dollar, and uh, your music with David was absolutely adored, and still is to this very day. I'm, you know, it makes me uh, always been about the music to me. When I discovered, I suddenly loved pop music, even though when I joined Guys and Dolls, I hadn't a clue what it was all about. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and I kind of learnt after a little bit. I really love music and. Uh, yeah, the 80s, weren't we lucky? It was such a magical time. So many fantastic acts and bands and sort of, you know, sort of musicians around. It really was special, wasn't it? Well, 14 top 40 hits, and it just tells us everything about what you were doing. And it was in a time when you really had to sell a lot of records to get into the charts. So, you know, it, it is a, a true measure of success. Oh, that's very nice of you to say. I think, um, yeah, it's funny, isn't it, at the time... You're sort of like it's like you're in the eye of the storm, and you kind of don't often understand sort of what's going on because you're just so busy. And we worked really, really hard. I mean, we were always moving around, and I had three suitcases on the go all the time. It's lucky that I ever had a costume to put on, you know, because <laughs> <laughs> it was mental. But uh, sort of decades later, it's the 40th anniversary of Dollar this year, which is why we tried so hard to kind of put put this like ultimate collection together, and. Um, it's only when you look back, you kind of realise some of, some of the records really were like little mini masterpieces, just just, and they still stand the test of time. Yeah. It's, cr- it's crazy. Uh, but, and absolutely true. It's really great uh, songs, and and that that is what happens. And and when it's something is such you know upbeat, high energy as as it was at the time, it must have really taken out of you bringing all this together. Even though we're all a lot younger than we were back in the day when I was listening to all of this. Well, how old were you when you were listening to all of this? Oh. Everyone I've been speaking to, they're going, well. You, I had your picture on my wall, or I was at school studying. <laughs> I'm well, going, I'm, right. <laughs> I'm afraid so. Well, I was born in 1972, so it was my oh, early teens, baby. really, when it was all you know, going absolutely mad for you. But uh, I mean, but great times and great memories. And uh, you know, the, the ultimate dollar is you know the, the the real collection. This is this is what's in there. I mean, and how have you pulled all this together? Because uh, uh, I, I believe things haven't been going quite as smoothly with David and yourself of late. Um. No, well, he basically hasn't really talked to me for the past five or six years, which um, is a bit disappointing. I think somebody said that's the word, which is a good word. It's not annoying anymore. It's just a bit disappointing after so many decades that that's his choice. But I think there are other people who kind of are having influences on him uh, in that regard. But Mm -hmm. eventually um, he did answer a couple of emails this year and said, yes, he's happy with the project to go ahead. So that was great. I mean, he didn't want to not block it or anything mm-hmm. and um, I've had um, one person shout out to Alan Connor and um, he's a really good friend of mine and he managed to pull this all together 
um, he knows more about me than I know about me, which is a bit <laughs> scary. <laughs> but uh, it, it does take a super fan sometimes to, to, to help get this sort of project off the ground. And, and what little gems are there in there that maybe we haven't heard for a very long time? Oh, well, there's a, a chap who's, uh, whose production company is called Fat Dog Productions, and he's done these extended mixes, um, sort of tw- old school speak, 12-inch versions yeah. mm-hmm. of some of the Trevor Horn singles that we never had 12-inch versions of. And he has done such a great job. I mean, when I heard them, I was shocked. They're so good. I kept listening to them over and over and over going, wow. And so they're they're really special. And there's um, a few tracks that never saw the light of day, so they're on there as well, and some demos and all kinds of stuff. That's a sort of you know, treasury that you, you, you're you bringing to the world. And, I mean, could this see a bit of a resurgence, do you think? I know that you did some work uh, with you and David uh, back in, uh, what, the early part of the noughties. Will we be seeing you maybe doing your side of some of these songs uh, on stage? Yeah, I actually don't know how I said yes to all of this. Someone said, well, if you're going to come to the UK, just do an evening with, just, just do it up front, close, personal, like your side of the story on some things and sing some songs in your way. And I sort of thought, wouldn't that be nice? So one thing led to another, so that's what I'm doing. So I'm doing a show in London on the 20th, that's Wednesday. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, doing some of the dollar songs, some of the songs from my solo album, The Big Kiss. Um, And one of the loveliest bits will be that Julie Forsyth and Martine Howard from Guys and Dolls, the original Dolls, the three of us, we will be reuniting on stage um, to sing a few songs together um, acoustically, which would be really special. I mean, that's 40, we had our 45th anniversary last week. 45 years, huh? Wow. That's a long time. <laughs> it, it is, but I'm 47, so it doesn't seem like that long, because I'm still trying to convince myself that's not long at all. But, uh, uh, yeah, it, it, it is great, though. But, again, it's all stood the test of time, and at least uh, at least there you can see these friendships that have lasted through as well, and the chance to perform together must be an absolutely amazing treat. Yeah, no, it will be. And I think we were having a chat last week and we were all laughing saying, well, we don't have any hip replacements and we can still <laughs> sing and we still have our marbles mostly, you know, a few few senior moments. But I was sort of thinking uh, really partly why have I decided to do it? And it's certainly, I sort of came to the realisation it's not because I'm doing it for any gratification or, you know, oh, well done, you did so well and had so many hits. It's nothing to do with that. It's more how does one age and kind of keep in touch with everything that you did in your youth and your early years. And, and, and if you've still got unfinished business and you've got the energy and you have an idea, then age is just a number. You should just get on with it because you never know what's going to happen. And um, I sort of that made me much more comfortable in a way with my decision that that really is the reason why I'm doing it. And kind of it's almost like banging the drum for anybody who's in, I'm, I'm in my 60s. And it kind of it doesn't really matter. Not absolutely really. Not. No. Well, I mean, the look is still absolutely amazing. You've got such a presence uh, when you perform. I'm sure it's going to be a fantastic gig down there at 229 Great Portland Street in London on Wednesday, the 20th of November. If you fancy get yourself along to that one, you can uh, grab your tickets online, I'm going to guess. Uh, yeah, you can. You can get onto my Facebook page. I think I think that's because I don't run it. But, uh, Theresa Bazaar official, mm. I think that's it. And, um, yeah, AD, um, the website, they're selling tickets. But it should be a fun night. I've got some surprise guests coming in as well and some, st- um, not stand-in for David, but some other very talented young men who are going to sing with me, which will be really fun too. So that's, that's good. Brilliant stuff. Well, Ultimate Dollar is also released, as we mentioned, on the 29th of November. That's it, where Cherry Red. So you've got plenty of material out there as we head towards 2020. Uh, with all the anniversaries you've had so far, I'm sure that uh, you're going to maybe you know, be even thinking about some new music. I trust we'll have something even tastier in the near future for you to bring to our uh, ears. Teresa Bazaar, thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you so much for inviting me on the programme. Thanks a lot. <laughs> It's a feeling I'm feeling through and through
Mississippi River near the ocean oh, Wilder than the desert and the Utah sky It's for you Stronger than the dynamos of Hoover Dam in motion You supply the reason there we go. That's Guys and Dolls, of course. Teresa Bazaar, part of that group. And with that event coming up on Wednesday, a great chance to relive some of the history surrounding the music. On the line now, I've got somebody who has been very successful in, in various disciplines of late. It is, of course, athlete Donald Brown. Hello, sir. How are you doing, Jason? I'm fine. How are you doing? Oh, good here. And uh, I'm, I'm glad you're well. And I'm glad you're doing great things because you are currently ranked number one in, in your class in uh, various numbers of events, aren't you? Yes, it's been an absolutely brilliant year for my athletics. I started off in March competing in Poland at the World Championships mm -hmm. and uh, was very fortunate to, to win the gold medal. And that was actually my very first individual gold medal at the world level, at the world championship level. And at that same championship, I also won the silver in the relay, 4 by one relay, and the bronze in the 60 meter sprint. So I was very pleased to come away with the full set, gold, silver and bronze. Absolutely. Well, impressive stuff. And uh, we expect nothing less of you, to be fair, though. You've got to do well because uh, uh, it, it, it is pretty much required. But it's nice when someone from our area is, do, is doing great things. And uh, uh, I, I'm, you're also up for an award from Athletics Weekly as well, aren't you? Yes, well, that's come as, a, I mean, going on from the World Championships, because it's been such a good year, in fact, what I didn't mention was, during the year, I broke three British records. I, um, it's easy the, to forget that sort of thing, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, quite, I wish. Um, the uh, the 100 meter hurdles, I broke the British record twice, yep. and the 300 meters, which is not an, an official event, but it is on the power of 10 official listing. I broke the British record for that. Mm -hmm. And then the nomination for the Athlete of the Year was further supported by my performance in um, September in Italy at the European Championships, where I won three gold medals uh, for Great Britain. And that was in the 100 meter hurdles, 100 meter sprint, and the, the 200 meters, and picked up a silver in the relay. So tell us so, about the uh, class of, of, uh, of athletics that we're looking at here. The way it works is this after the age of 35, you, an, an individual, an athlete, can then qualify to become a master's athlete. And you compete against athletes around the world in your age group. And the age group ranges for five years. So if you're 35, you're competing against athletes who are 35, 36, 37, 38, and 39. Then you graduate to the next stage, which is 40, and 50, 45, 50, and so on and so forth. I'm in the 55 age category. You wouldn't know so it to I'm, look at you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. It's <laughs> obviously keeping you very young. It do, you know what? It's, that is so true because even with the aches and pains, I would not change it for the world because I am in, I would not believe at the age of 13, 14, 15, I'd be sprinting still and hurdling at this age. So it does really have its benefits. Well, obviously, it, it's going great for you in the uh, the world of track and field. Uh, and, and how is the rest of your work coming along? Because, uh, of course, you're uh, now a renowned sculptor as well as the great things you're doing on the track. I, I'm guessing you haven't had much time to sculpt this year. <laughs> you, you, you hit the nail on the head right there, mate. But you know what? It One actually benefits the other because... The particular sculpture that you'll be familiar with, the one with the sporting mm -hmm. elements and the, the narrative there, becoming um, number one in the world in four events and achieving what I've done this year has helped to really give that sculpture even more sort of substance and value and credibility because I'm speaking from both sides of the coin, not just as a sculptor, but also as a world-ranked athlete as well. And so that really helps to sort of promote and push the work I'm doing because that I'm looking to use to promote, um, or should, should I say, to, to, to start the campaign against bullying and violence. Mm -hmm. And so it really helps to sort of bring the two together. But just, just going back to what you said before regarding the, the nominations, Athletics Weekly magazine are now, they've released the list of all the athletes that are athletes of the year. Mm -hmm. And from Dina Asher-Smith, Shelly Ann Fraser-Price, in the different categories, I'm in the master's category. Yeah. So anyone can go online, just Google Athletics Weekly, uh, Reader's Choice Awards, 
and just nominate for Donald Brown. Hopefully, if you uh, are impressed by my achievements. Absolutely. Well, I, I certainly am. Athleticsweekly.com is their main web address. There'll be links through to the Reader's Choice Awards areas, as Donald says. Google it, click on the links, and uh, you can select who you want in each category. If you only know the British Masters category and it is the male that you're looking at, therefore it is Donald you want to be voting for, you can do that. Um, as I think I just have done now. So I think oh, I've got that sorted, even whilst we're talking on the phone now. <laughs> but Donald, I mean, can continue good luck. I mean, where, how does it go for your next lot of uh, events? Uh, uh, is, is there anything going on during the winter months, so where, where it's a little uh, brighter elsewhere in the world? Well, right now we're in the off-season, so it's down to the nitty-gritty hard training, and so we're looking to have the first event, hopefully at Lee Valley in uh, London on the 1st of January. So we're looking to open the year with that. They have that every year, which is a great turnout. And uh, that will be my beginning of the indoor season, getting ready for the European uh, indoor in Braga, Portugal uh, in March. So, again, another busy year. 2020, hopefully even more successful, if that's possible, than uh, 2019. We look forward to uh, hearing more great results from you and, of course, more on your sculpting work very soon. Give us all the details of where we can find you on social media, etc. Certainly. Um, the website is theglobalgallery.com. Twitter is at Donald Brown Art. So check those out there. And, of course, you'll be able to find him in, in all good athletics magazines with the uh, uh, excellent response that we've had to your efforts this year. Donald Brown, thank you for joining us. Appreciate it, Jason. Thank you very much. study analysing neighbourly behaviour, including dropping off deliveries, taking the bins out and having them round for tea, shows that the most positive acts have improved since last year. And we've also got on the way the Neighbourhood Watches Neighbour of the Year Award. To tell us more, I've got quite a gaggle of people over there. Not only have you got TV legend Charlie Dimmock. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How are uh, you? I'm good. You OK? Yeah, good. Thank you. Good stuff. We've got a Director of Communities, Rebecca Birkbrook. Hello. Hi there. And also, John Hayward Cripps, CEO of Neighbourhood Watch. Uh, hello to you too. Good afternoon. So, uh, first of all, uh, Charlie, yeah. you know how uh, to get communities together because uh, through Green Spaces, uh, you've sort of been encouraging people to have a good time in those communities. So this, this feeling of community cohesion all sorts of builds as one. Yeah, I, I've done quite a lot of community gardens over the years, and this, this, um, the new awards that have come, new award that's come out this year, the Community Space one, which is the award from the Co-op and Neighbourhood Watch. Um, community spaces are great places to get neighbours together because us British people, we're all a bit shy and retiring and don't like, you know, that knocking on a door and introducing yourself. Whereas we find that if you do a community garden, you know, you get to know your neighbours without having that formal setting. Um, it's a quite a nice, easy way to introduce people to each other uh, as well as making a huge difference to the area so, yeah, so it gets people to see, you know, socialize a little bit but you say you've, you've got that green space and that can put people at ease as well can't it there's nothing like sitting by a herbaceous border to make you feel good yeah i mean being outside away from the phone and stressed computers things like that um, but also, I mean, we did a community garden. There was a, a lady that had recently lost her husband uh, and she felt a bit intimidated about going out 
uh, going down to the shops on her own. And by doing the community garden, she got to meet some of her neighbours, which just reassured her that that space outside the front door was welcoming and okay to go out on your own. Um, and also we know from doing gardening, it's a, it's a great thing for sort of mental health, positive side of things. Um, and any way we can get to know our neighbours, the better it is. Mm -hmm. And getting to know our neighbours, John, that can make a massive difference in making a neighbourhood watch work. Of course it can. We know that um, if you're connected to your neighbours and you feel proud of your neighbourhood and, and you, know, you know people there, crime goes down, you feel better about your community, you feel more proud of it. And that's the same for older people, younger people. When we, when we like our community, we take care of it more in every which way. And when it comes down to these awards, uh, so what uh, what have we seen coming out of the uh, the Midlands region? I'm really delighted actually to be on Wolverhampton Radio because that's my neck of the woods. I was brought up in the Black Country, and what we saw coming through is that people um, really want to be. They, you know, we believe that we are good neighbours. We saw it there that um, people really want to know their neighbours, although funnily enough, not as many of us as want to know them do actually know them. So mm. there's loads of rooms that we can kind of we know people to wave at um but we'd really like to get to know them better and you'll you'll know that um the black country the whole thing about it is really strong community feeling and we definitely saw that come through mm -hmm. and that's how the co-op work as well isn't it because you're very often a store at the heart of the community that's exactly it i mean we're a community retailer people in some of our stores, you know, we have sometimes people come in more than once a day because of that feeling of they can have a chat there and they can engage there. And we see it, um, you know, we've obviously with our funeral care homes as well, where that's a time in your life where it really matters to, to feel that you're surrounded by people who understand you and understand your community and the kind of, and how you would want things to um to, to be arranged for you so it's um we've the community the co-op grew up in communities and it's a really really important of, part of what of what we do today which is why we're so delighted to be part of these awards and also to share such positive stories you know it's a bit of a challenging time at the moment isn't it so mm -hmm. what an absolute joy to be on the radio talking about such a positive thing yeah well in, in a digital age when you know we've got people ordering things online and having parcels delivered it's always great to have someone in the community you know you can trust or often they can be dropped off at shops and stores as well uh, but also i mean on, on the only downside we've seen things like uh, poor parking barking dogs and uh, maybe the occasional <laughs> gardening issue being an issue so i mean but, but charlie give us give us a clue how do you solve gardening problems when someone's made Maybe fruit trees hanging over into next door well it's that thing you know if you're talking to your neighbor yes you it's a bit like family yes you're going to have that fallout at some point i'm sure but if you're actually you know you do communicate you know time passes by a little bit and then you start talking again and what i'll say when it comes to gardening whether it's hedges and that type of thing you know cutting them on that side of of the work if you let your neighbor watch know what you're about to do then it's not such a terrible shock to them it in, invariably is when you just they suddenly come home from work and you've cut down half your hedge mm -hmm. and they're not expecting it so if you just be a bit more considerate and courteous let them know you know and if you are talking to your neighbors even if it is just a nod and a wave and a good morning then it just makes it easier and there's not such a confrontation about it. And you never know, they might be in on the fact that an entire team of gardeners are about to turn up and transform your garden, as we see you do on television so many ways. Well, that's true. <laughs> and I have to say, quite a lot of the time, people and neighbours are quite happy if you're taking down trees and conifers. I would say just be very selective about all the trees you take down. Trees are good for the gardener, so are hedges. Mm -hmm. So uh, make sure it's, it's a balance. But everything uh, can, can be balanced out. That's right. And John, tell us uh, about the actual awards. Who are we giving a shout out to? Who's uh, who's won some awards this time around? Well, I think the the national award winner is Nilesh from Leeds, who just does an amazing job in his uh, in his community. He's really involved, helping people with with complaints to the council. He gives away free food sometimes. Set up a Facebook group. I mean, that's the national winner. But in the uh, in the East Midlands, we've got uh, Julie who's done a fantastic thing really with her community, goes around, helps with children's games, does some things with the children in the street. So there's loads of loads of really good, really good examples. And I think in the West Midlands, as, uh, as Rebecca was saying, there's been some fantastic uh, winners that have come through and are just all the time doing 
simple things in their community, making that, making going that extra yard to make a difference for their community. And the co-op have got some details on the website about all of this? That's right, we have, yes. So if you go to co-op insurance and then look for neighbor, neighbourhood awards. And you can check out the details there. About, I mean, of all the awards, which one do you think probably surprised you most that people were doing? Is it, is it 43% saying they're not nosy? <laughs> one of the things that was amazing in the awards, there was one person that was nominated who was in her 90s and she wasn't being nominated because she was needy and needed no but she was the person that helped out in her community so i think that was one of the most surprising things someone of that age is really valuable member of their community yeah and and possibly remembers uh, times before things maybe went a little downhill probably what 60s 70s 80s when but where we were a little less friendly than we uh, we'd like to consider that we are now yeah, maybe. And perhaps this is a really good sign and a good news story of this bit where actually we're trying harder and we are getting on better with our neighbours and doing more for them now than we have been for a long time, which is really fantastic news. Well, I think if Charlie Dimmick was your neighbour, you wouldn't be too worried because you know the garden's going to be in tip-top condition and you've always got <laughs> someone to have a nice chat with because she's, uh, she's so lovely. But there we go. <laughs> That's right. Work, yeah, works like works that. for me every time. <laughs> Absolutely. I don't know. Right. Well, thank you to uh, uh, Rebecca Bergbeck, uh, Director of Communities at the Co-op, CEO of Neighbourhood Watch, John Hayward Cripps, and, of course, TV legend. It's on my script. I've got to say it. We know it's true. Charlie <laughs> Dimmock, thank that. you very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Brits would choose savings over putting money into charity. To tell us more about this recent research, I'm joined now by Nick Hewer and Tom Dannett, CEO of Street Child. Good afternoon to you both. Good afternoon. Right, so uh, first of all, uh, explain a bit about this uh, survey, please, Tom. Yeah, thanks. Um, so we, we, we wanted to, to explore people's motivations, their thought process around giving, and um, particularly what they did is they came across money they didn't have. And um, yeah, the results are interesting. I don't know what you sort of draw from them. But basically, if people come across money, I don't know, in their car or back of the sofa, proverbially speaking, and they feel they earned that money, they tend to keep it and spend it on themselves. Um, if people come across money that sort of they feel they didn't earn, it just kind of land on the lap, maybe it's not theirs, then they are far more likely to give it to a, to a charity. Um, draw from this what you, what you will. Um, I think what we're trying to to, to, to con- convey here is is the, the idea that what we might regard as small sums of money, and um, and, and here we're talking about seven pounds eighty two is the amount of um, of money that that uh, someone in the West Midlands typically has lying around a home, whether they know it or not. Now, seven pounds eighty two um, can just about get you a couple of pints of beer. Um, doubled. By the British government, the British government is doubling all donations to Street Child at the moment up until early January. Um, that is just north of fifteen pounds. Fifteen pounds, believe it or not, is enough money to send a child in Sierra Leone to school for a year. Um, and we, we we're running this appeal called Mind the Gap at the moment, um, and we're just asking people not, not to feel in any way guilty about about the way we get to live in this part of the world, um, but just to be mindful of. The huge gap that exists between us here, whatever our relative um, troubles might be, and those living in the very toughest parts of the world, places like Sierra Leone, Afghanistan, DR Congo. Um, and we just want to highlight how far that money can go. And uh, you know, Nick has been with me in, in, in Sierra Leone on a number of occasions, and he has seen for himself um, how far £15 pounds, um, goes. Yeah, it's true, because in Freetown, the capital, um, there's uh, something called the Daily Survivor. And this is the amount of money that somebody down there has got to earn in the day in order to get through the day. And the Daily Survivor, how much is it? Why? It's 80 pence. And once you've got your 80 pence, you can get through the day, and then you're going to have to work again tomorrow to try and find that 80 pence. So, you know, you, can't, you couldn't even begin 
to buy a newspaper for 80 pence in mm-hmm. this country, but there you can feed and drink and all the rest of it for the day. Um, and, and when you're over there, I mean, I, what are how you... How far money goes. Uh, but when you're over there, I mean, how how do you see this, uh, you know, sort of present itself? I mean, are people getting to the minimum they can earn and then moving off? What sort of jobs are they doing to, to bring this sort of money in? Because it, it's well, going to be a far cry from what we've seen on The Apprentice in the past where you've been. <laughs> I know. The thing is um, that they're earning that money in any way that they can because really Sierra Leone is dirt poor. It really, truly is dirt poor. So they're buying something, selling something, they're doing a little job, they're sweeping this, they're doing whatever it is to get enough to get them through the day. Now, Tom was saying that £7.50, whatever it is that you find down the back of the sofa, doubled by the British government under this Mind the Gap street child um, uh, uh, organization, um, it's doubled to £15, and that educates a child for a year. Now, the point is, if we can't get the children into school, it may well be that the child runs away from home because the parents can't afford to keep them and, uh, and get them to school. They live like urchins, dangerously, mm-hmm. in the street, sleeping under tables in the market, under lorries in the lorry park. And that's a dangerous place for kids. It's no place for kids. And what we do is we help the the parents to be able to support that child. We get the child back into the family, and then that child goes to school. That's the point, getting kids into education and not running wild. That's why it's called street child, and that's what happened. And I might tell you that I interviewed a young chap a few years ago now, Mm -hmm. And uh, he was about eight, he was in school, had his little uniform on, and we were chatting to him through an interpreter because sometimes it's difficult to actually understand the the way that um, Sierra Leonean speak. And he was saying, well, the thing is, I'm so pleased to be in school because it's election time. I said, oh, really? So what's that got to do with it? Well, he said that the election time is very dangerous for children, street children living in the street because sometimes the election, the uh, the um, politicians go off into the see their witch doctor, and the witch doctor might tell them, if you really want to get elected, you're going to have to do something fairly radical. It may well be that you're going to have to you know, eat the liver of a small boy. And the kid told me that actually at election time, if he were living in the streets, they would run into the bush and hide until the elections were over. This is dangerous stuff. We've got to get those kids back to their families and into school. Certainly sounds like the potential politicians need a good bit of education as well to try and get them back onto. Uh... Well, that's that's well point well made. Yeah. Point well made, but, but also actually a serious point because um, when education, um, so the lack of education, is so pervasive in society, this kind of um, nonsense um, you know, pre- 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 prevails. And, and um, this is you know, the heart of street child's belief is that education is what will, over a period of time. Um, move the bar in, in the world's poorest countries, both for the individuals themselves and 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 the wider and, and and the wider society. And you know, this is why literally child by child, um, you know, street judges focuses on getting more and more children into school, and um, and street should also focus on making sure the quality of the schools that we're sending children to um, is of a meaningful standard. And so we have more child, more children rather, um, as a result of street child's work being able to read, write, add up, and take away, which, to my mind, is what just gives you the, the minimum basis for a, a fair crack at this this world. Yeah, I mean, with 250,000 kids plus helped already, it's a start. It doesn't even touch the surface. 25,000 families that have been supported is only the beginning. More work needs to be done. That, that is exactly it. Um, there are 125 million children in the world who are out of school altogether. And then you go beyond that and you think that there are hundreds more who are in the schools, but those schools are such a low quality that they're really learning nothing at all. And these are the issues. It's the kind of global learning crisis um, uh, that, um, that that Street Child is, is working on you know, day in, day out. Focusing, our particular focus is on the world's toughest places. So that's the world's poorest countries, places like Sierra Leone, and then disaster and conflict affected um, countries, places like Afghanistan, Congo, um, and, and uh, refugee settlements in places like Uganda and northeast Ni- Ni- Nigeria, where we feel the need is greatest. And then you'd be surprised to know that in these toughest places, you often find that charitable support is actually the, actually the least. Why? Because they're the hardest places to get to. Mm-hmm. You find the 
lot of the largest charities concentrated around the, the capital cities, often with a more comfy hotel, um, and it's easier to get to near the tarmac roads. Street child staff are routinely, and Nick and I have been down these roads together, down long, bumpy roads, getting across rivers with implausible, um, but nerve-wracking bridges. Um, we had to go across on canoe in the past to get to villages where there had never been a school before. Um, and this is the work we this is the work we do, and um, this is what we're really trying to get across. Well, obviously, there's there's a lot to be done, and it's through your uh, your celebrity ambassadors, the likes of, of Nick Hewer, who, yeah. well, Tom, you met what ten years ago. I'm sure you pass on your thanks to Nick for all that he's done so far, and all the others that work with you on this one. But people can donate if they have got that money down the back of the settee, you know, whatever it is. Be a bit more generous. Think of those that you can help with this, and basically think of of changing up the the, the whole situation for you know, these people through charities like Street Child. So, absolutely, no, Nick is absolute rock star for Street Child, um, and we are very grateful for his support in amplifying our messages, and 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 and, and to you here at WCR um, in in giving us the chance to to talk about it. But mm. uh, this is this is exactly it. We're so grateful to everyone who who, who supports, and it is just so needed because. I don't want to live, and I think a lot of us don't want to live in a world where there is such a stark um, uh, lack of equality, um, and we have hundreds of millions of children growing up without um, a, fair, a fair prospect. And so we're here to try and change that one one child at a time. And um, we're all part of the chain of chain of change. So thank you so much. Well, where can people go to donate? Well, get straight onto your computer. Just tap in your uh, street child. And up will come the Street Child website and pop your um, <laughs> your credit card details into that. And a lot of children will be delighted and, you know, all the better for it. Mm-hmm. That's about, Just one final thing. You know, Street Child, it's a no-frills charity. They, get, they roll their sleeves up and they get stuck in. And when the Ebola crisis hit down in, there in West Africa in, in Sierra Leone, they were on the ground, running within days of the outbreak, feeding the kids, the orphan kids. Remember, you know, a lot of orphans were created during that terrible mm-hmm. time. Yep. And Street Child, there was no, you know, conferences about it. They just got stuck in with their local uh, local volunteers. A fantastic, roll your sleeves up sort of charity. Well, Street Child is a charity you're looking out for the details on. Please donate. As you've already heard, those funds that you are donated are being doubled at the moment through the Mind the Gap programme. So check out the details on there. But for now, Tom Dunnett, CEO of Street Child, and Nick Hewer, thank you both for joining us. Thank you very much, Nick. Research has revealed nearly half of Brits admit to buying the latest gadgets to stay up to date despite having no idea how to work them. Somebody who knows a thing or two about this is singer, actress and TV presenter Louise Redknapp. Good afternoon. Hi, how are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. All good. So, I mean, where does your hatred of technology begin? Is it the smartphone, the smart TV or do you just not like even using some of the other gadgets around the home? Um, do you know what? It kind of goes across the board. <laughs> um, it's just really getting things up and running and, and working. And for me, Wi-Fi was a big thing. Trying yep. to get Wi-Fi throughout the house was, was something that will make my life a lot easier. 
Yeah, well, once you're online and you can get everything talking, it should just run in the background, but it can be that initial step that, that starts us having problems. But I think, is it, what is it, about 19% of adults say they've left expensive gadgets to gather dust. And is, is there like a, a, a pile of smartphones in your home which is just doing nothing? Um, no, do you know what it is more with me? There's lots of kind of, you know, those things you buy over Christmas, like things that kind of hook up and gaming devices and things that need to be plugged in and worked out how to sync them up. It's all mm -hmm. those things, like kid things, that I struggle with. <laughs> well, with the consumers spending around £3,600 a year on new devices and upgrades, and just at a half saying they've never read the instruction manual, then I think that's probably where a lot of us are falling down, isn't it? It's getting to, to grips with the small print to find out what to do. Um, yeah, I think, I know for me, I very rarely read a, man a manual and... Uh, sort of like work out you, it takes time to read these manuals and then they're really confusing when you do <laughs> um, so yeah I, I mean for me uh, it was just one of those things that every time I get a manual for something I start reading it and then and give up and think right no there must be somebody that can help me work out how to use this um, so yeah for me I needed a little bit of help yeah, and this is where BT come in, because you've already mentioned about getting Wi-Fi throughout your own home, and with their discs, you can do that now nice and simply. But they've also got a team of 900 nationwide tech specialists from their home tech experts yeah. who can make life simple for you too. Yeah, well, that's what I had, and that's why it was kind of quite a lovely, nice thing to do, because I got the, the privilege of having this, where someone comes around your house and basically asks you what you need, what you need to do, what you want, what you're lacking in your home, and they kind of come and just sort it all out for you. So, <laughs> as simple as that. And you, you turn up with a load of boxes, you've got Alexa, you've got the, an Echo, you know, all that sort of thing, and they just basically come and, and fix it? Well, they just make sure it's all working and explain and, and make it as simple as possible. I mean, for me, like I said, having Wi-Fi throughout the house that was fast and efficient and was something that was lacking in my house. And they sorted that out and made it so it's the same strength in every room, which has been great for things like homework, working, um, getting on and offline very quickly. So, um, yeah, those things. But then also if you if you've got trouble with linking things up with your computer or like your Alexa, all those things, they'll put all of that straight. Yeah, because I can imagine you're somebody who likes a good box set as well, and unless the TV's connected oh. properly, you can't win, can you? <laughs> oh, I know. I can't bear it when I there's something advertised to think I really want to watch that, and then it's on a channel I don't have, and I'm not quite sure how to get it. <laughs> <laughs> so basically you get a, a two-hour appointment slot. They're available seven days a week, and at your convenience, the team can come along and check out what you need to, to make it all yeah. work and, and get you sorted. Basically, that's it, yeah. So what was the, the, the worst thing? What had you been dreading sorting out that they fixed for you? Um, I, I wasn't really dreading. Do you know, it was just really nice to have someone to come and simplify the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, once, you, once you're there, once it's set up, and now everything communicates beautifully, you've got the box set on in the front room and the, yeah. you know, the, the family <laughs> doing homework. Bedroom, yeah. not bothering me. <laughs> that, that's the way it should be, isn't it? That, we, we all want a nice, quiet life, and with our technology, we absolutely. can make it happen. That sounds good yes, to me. Absolutely. Well, where can we go to find out more about this one? Um, you're best to go to find out all the ins and outs and the proper details in, on bt.com slash halo. So Halo is what we're looking for on bt.com. Yes, .com. And, and yeah. you can uh, have a, a, a brilliant time once your home is sorted. All the technology is talking to each other and there are no headaches. We, we like the sound of that, All don't up we? and running. All up and running and not wasting money buying things you can't use. That's the way <laughs> it should be. Louis Redknapp, thank you for joining us. Oh, pleasure. Thanks. Well, that's a lot for this week. Thank you so much for joining us. Back with episode 544 next week. I'll see you then. So, for now. Goodbye from the mill bar. 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 Yeah. Goodbye from the mill bar. Yeah.